Christ, how are we doing this morning? Woo-hoo. I'm excited to be here with you this morning. My name is Nathan Trenier. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and it's going to be a good morning. Amen? All right. We are going to worship Jesus. Uh, before we do that, can we all stand and uh, pray here? In order for anything to ever be seen, light has to be cast down upon it. And just in that way, Jesus is the light that is cast down upon our path so that we can see each and every step, the next step, the next step, the next step. So it's a life uh, that is built on trust of each faithful decision that is made in him. And because of this, we we will never be alone. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you this morning. I pray that as we sing these songs, that we would love you in a real way. And we know that we'll never truly be alone because each faithful step that we make in you, each step of obedience that we take, you will cast down more light and guidance of what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to stay, who we're supposed to meet and all that stuff. So Lord Jesus, we just, uh, we want to worship you. This is a time of freeing our hearts and our minds of all the worries and struggles going on in our life and knowing that you are above them all. And so we just want to worship you as the God who is above all of our struggles. We love you. All this we pray in your amazing name of Jesus. Amen. the cross as something done for us, we must see it as something done by us. So for our confession today, let's pray. Jesus, forgive us whenever we fail to reflect and share your love. And hear our silent confession now for all the times that we've recently failed in our thoughts, words, and actions to honor you and obey your word. Hear us now as we silently offer them to you. Almighty God, in his mercy, hears your sincere confession. As you trust in Jesus, remember that everything he's done for us through his life, death, and resurrection has taken our sin mortgage and paid for it fully. Every day you wake up with a clean slate in Christ. So know that as you trust in him, you're fully forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing This 
on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you never fail. The promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my faithful Lord we thank and praise you that we have an opportunity to gather in your presence today fill us with your word fill us with your Lord's Supper in a few moments Lord have your way in us so that we can share the good news of the Easter victory every day in Jesus name we pray amen please be seated everyone so we're going to be watching our sermon video and uh, prepare for today's message if you want to in your own iPhone or on your, on your Bibles in the pew Bibles we're going to be looking at first Peter chapter 3 today Well, I love Easter Sunday, and I hope you guys had a wonderful experience last week gathering with all your family and friends. You know, the Easter season is amazing. Wasn't it great that today the Lord also draped some white covering on us, reminding us that we're white as snow in his forgiveness? But here's the deal. 
in the world right now, the population is just a little bit over 8 billion people. And of that, 2.5 billion people identify themselves as Christian. So last Sunday, they guesstimate that about a million sermons were preached on Easter Sunday throughout the world. Can you imagine? And yet, let me ask you a question. Do you know who preached the first Easter sermon and where it was preached? Well, today we're going to find out that Jesus preached the first Easter sermon, ironically, in hell. And we believe this because the Bible teaches this, but we profess this regularly whenever we say the Apostles' Creed. So take a look at uh, the Creed this morning. Um, Here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried, and here's the spot. He descended into hell. And then it continues on that he was raised on the third day. By the way, I don't know if you knew this, but this teaching on Jesus' descent into hell was not in the original Apostle Creed versions. And it's not included in the Nicene Creed at all. However, today we're going to learn that between Jesus' death and burial on Good Friday and before the Easter uh, angel appeared rolling away the stone from the tomb, at some point between those two events, we just read from Psalm that Jesus' dead body did not decay, but instead He was made alive by the Spirit and bodily descended into hell for all the right reasons. And we're going to talk about this Christian doctrine, this biblical teaching today, especially from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 and following. But let's be honest, when it comes to Jesus and heaven, well, that's a natural fit. So, for example, look at John 14, verse 3, not 13, verse 3. Jesus says, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. And then he promises, I'm going to come back and take you to be with me where I am. So, when it comes to Jesus in heaven, they're congruent, right? They're complementary. They are harmonious. They go well together. But Jesus descending into hell, well, that's odd, right? That seems incongruent. It's kind of like fitting a round peg into a square hole. So, this morning, maybe... A different illustration will help us to get our head around this teaching of Jesus descending into hell. Now, if you're my age, back in the old days, for for just about 30 years, from 1970 to 1998, every Saturday afternoon, ABC Sports, wide world of sports, would always begin the same way. It would start like this. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports. The thrill of victory. And the agony of defeat. Now, for 30 years, it would always start out with successful teams, amazing athletes doing some incredible accomplishment, right? It was the thrill of victory. But all those nearly 30 years, it always described the agony of defeat the same way. The guy was a ski jumper from Yugoslavia. His name was Victor Bogatai. And as he's heading down the ski jump, you remember, it was a colossal wipeout. It was the wipeout of all wipeouts. And unfortunately, that was always called the agony of defeat. Now, by the way, poor Victor, unfortunately, suffered a concussion and a broken ankle. But when you see that spill, you're like, The blessing of God, it wasn't way worse than that, right? But fortunately, this relatively unknown ski jumper named Victor, he became an overnight celebrity all as a result of his epic crash. 
Why did I share this with you? Because Jesus, today we're going to hear, hear about, turned the greatest agony of defeat into the ultimate thrill of victory. And his good buddy, his, uh, one of his 12 disciples, Peter, wrote about this many years later. And again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 and following. So take a look at this verse. He says, Even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Don't fear their threats. Don't be frightened. So Peter writes to Jesus' followers who are going through a major hostility, hatred, and persecution because they're living in the evil reign of the Roman emperor Nero. Horrible time for Christians. And yet, here's Peter. He's saying, you know what? No matter what your circumstances are, right? Stand firm. Keep trusting in Jesus. Don't give up on him. And then he tells us this famous verse. You know this, verse 15. In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do so with gentleness and respect. When you think of this verse in its context, imagine these early Christians were being persecuted and suffering and going through all these horrible things, and yet... They still were at peace and at joy in their hearts for Jesus. And all the people were looking at them like, what is it about these Christians, right? And so Peter is saying, always be prepared to share your faith story. If your circumstances are good or bad, always be able to tell others around you in a minute or two, what difference has Jesus made in your life, in your future? How has your life been transformed? And as you share your testimony with others, the Holy Spirit will also uh, many, many times use that to grab people's attention, but even more importantly, will use your testimony to draw others closer and closer to Jesus. So all of this is going on, right? Peter's saying, hang in there through thick and thin, be ready to share your faith, but then we get to the meat of today's text. It's found here, in our next passage, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. He writes, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And there's so much packed in this one verse, but let's just highlight a couple of truths here. First of all, Peter is saying to all of us, you know what, it was our sins that should have been punished. We were the ones that should have experienced the shame and the disgrace and all the eternal penalty But Jesus, notice what he does, he offers his sinless, perfect, 100% righteous life on Calvary's cross in our place. And it was, by the way, completely different from any sacrifice anybody had seen up to this point. Because remember, throughout the Old Testament, all the way up to the days of Jesus, every day at 9 and at 3, they would offer sacrifices. They would offer bulls, lambs, goats, pigeons. And they had to repeatedly offer these again and again and again because an animal sacrifice could only cover people's sins. It couldn't cleanse their hearts. That's why they had to keep doing them. But notice Jesus' sacrifice is once for all. We don't have to do any more sacrifices because Jesus' blood, his life offered lovingly in our place pays for the sins of the world. Every sin that's ever been committed since Adam and Eve to the last beat that will ever harden, uh, beat on, heart that will beat on this earth, Jesus has paid them all. So as Jesus is nailed to Calvary's cross, to the world it seems like the ultimate agony of defeat. But Jesus is like, no, I'm offering my life one time so that I will make a pathway back to a saving relationship with God. And now through faith in Christ, you know the best news. Not only has that mortgage for all of our sin debt been paid fully and been completely shredded, but through your faith in Jesus, you also know the great news. That because of Christ, you now have access directly right into the heavenly throne room of God the Father. But there's even more blessings. Notice what Peter writes next. In verses 18 and 19, he, Jesus, was put to death in the body, 
but made alive by the Spirit. And here's the teaching on the descent into hell. Through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, this teaching of, uh, of Jesus' descent into hell really answers these three questions by looking at this one Bible passage. Question number one is, when did Jesus descend into hell? So again, as we mentioned earlier, at some point between Jesus' burial on Good Friday and his bodily resurrection and his appearance to several people on Easter morning, right? To Mary Magdalene, to Peter, to John, to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Between those events, the Holy Spirit, according to that verse that we just read, brought Jesus back to life. He made him alive, and now Jesus bodily descends into hell. And he appears there without anybody being aware of it except God and those who saw him then in the underworld. Secondly, what was the purpose of this visit? Now, so remember, Jesus didn't descend into hell in order to receive more punishment, more suffering for our sins. He paid for that fully on Calvary's cross. So why is Jesus bodily descending into hell? Well, remember on Good Friday, Satan and all the hordes of hell, all of his fallen angels, all of his demons, everybody who was there was an unbeliever, was rejoiced because they thought Jesus had been defeated. They were reveling in that. So Jesus bodily goes to hell you know, before he rises from the dead. He appears down there to make that announcement because certainly Satan was never going to tell everybody in hell that Jesus had risen. So Jesus appears while the party is going on in hell and says, turn out the lights, the party's over. As we've talked about before, the descent into hell well, I want you to think of it this way. When Jesus rose from the dead, he scored the touchdown. But when Jesus descended into hell, he spiked the football and did the gritty dance. That's what the descent of hell is. And Colossians chapter 2 is a proof passage that explains what happens when Jesus goes into hell. Notice what it says. Having disarmed the powers and authorities of darkness, right? Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, there's an old school hymn that uh, it's called, He's Risen, He's Risen, Christ Jesus the Lord. And that hymn also teaches very clearly the descent into hell. So stanza two talks about what happens on the cross. The foe was triumphant, went on Calvary, the foe, devil, the Lord of creation was nailed to the tree, and Satan's domain did the host shout and cheer, for Jesus was slain, whom that evil ones fear. But then verse 3, what happens when Jesus descends into hell? Short was their triumph, the Savior arose. In death, hell, and Satan he vanquished his foes. The conquering Lord lifts his banner on high. He lives, yes, he lives, and will never more die. Jesus descends into hell, then according to to 1 Peter 3, verse 19, notice what he starts doing. He preached to these spirits. Spirits, again, are angels. And the angels in hell are Satan and all of his fallen angels. He preaches to them in prison, in hell. What does he preach is question number three. Well, when Jesus gets there, you know that he doesn't say like he did on earth when he began his ministry. Jesus preached, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. He didn't preach that in hell. Because once you're in hell, there's no second chance. Does that make sense? God's word explains this carefully in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It's appointed for a, a man or a person to die once, and after that comes judgment. So when Jesus appears bodily in hell, he's not preaching Again, a message of a second chance, right, for salvation. Because only in this life do people have an opportunity to hear the gospel and receive it. By the way, that means there's a huge urgency in your life and in my life, in the life of every Christian. Because it's only in this lifetime that people that aren't connected to Jesus have an opportunity to hear the gospel receive it, and believe it by the Holy Spirit's power. 
So who are your family members, your friends, your people in your circle of influence that are drifted from Jesus or are disconnected from him? God may be calling on you to be that very person to make all the difference. So, Jesus descends bodily into hell, and the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what he says. We don't know what he preached in hell. But just the fact that when Jesus bodily shows up, he doesn't have to say a word. Because his bodily resurrection presence declares to everybody in that domain of darkness, we've been defeated. So Satan and all the evil demons, at this point, you know what they're thinking, like, oh, why are we celebrating? Even our best, nailing Jesus to the cross, did, you know, didn't work. And so Jesus is literally telling to everybody there in hell, the powers of Satan, death, the grave and hell, you are now under my direction. You're my subjects. Along with that, how does Jesus change the agony of defeat into the ultimate thrill of victory? Well, again, the Bible doesn't say exactly what Jesus preached in hell, but you know that one of the things that he had to have said to Satan is this. As a result of my resurrection, you have to be hands off my people. So Jesus is saying to Satan, you can still tempt my people here on earth. You can still disrupt their lives. You can still oppress them but only up to a point and no further. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? You and I never, ever, ever have to think about the devil unless we are knowingly breaking God's word. Now we're drifting into the domain of darkness. But otherwise, I mean, think about this. Jesus is simply saying to all the powers of darkness, because I love my children, because I promise to protect them, and because I promise to work out all things for good for those who love and trust in me, whatever you do to my children here on earth, Satan, the result's going to be the same as this outcome for me. I'm only going to give you enough rope to hang yourself. So, all of this is happening. The devil is, being, is hearing from Jesus about all of what's about his victory. Now, I want you to think about this. Remember, we talked about this earlier. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of everybody, of all time, once for all. So everybody that's in hell, all of their sins have already been paid for also by Jesus. And I love this verse from Matthew 25, verse 41. Jesus tells us that the eternal fire, hell, was prepared for who? The devil and his angels. Hell wasn't prepared originally for people. Notice instead, God's word tells us in 1 Timothy 2 that our Savior wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody to be saved. So here's how it works. On this earth, if people want nothing to do with Jesus, with a broken heart, after they die, he says, you can have it exactly the way you want. I won't be part of your life forever. And so when Jesus is preaching in hell, it's the one Christian sermon that was preached with no gospel. Every time that you come here and Pastor Craig and I preach, heaven help us. There better be a word of Christ's forgiveness, Christ's love, and eternal salvation. Amen? That gospel has to be there. But on this first Easter sermon that Jesus preached in hell, there wasn't a word of gospel. Instead, it was just a, a matter of a chilling statement to everybody there of, you could have and you should have, but you didn't. It was utter hopelessness. How about us today, though? How does this teaching and Jesus descent into hell apply to our lives. What's the good news for us? What's the greatest news? Well, th 
Think about this person. As Jesus is in hell, he's also surrounded not only by Satan and all these demons, but by all the lost souls of, of unbelievers. And so when Jesus is in hell, remember just two days earlier, two people died at Jesus' side on crosses. One of those people, I wonder, when Jesus got to hell, if he looked into the eyes of this person. Remember the person who on one side of Jesus insulted him, jeered him, and refused to believe in him that entire six hours they were together on the cross. Did Jesus say to that person, hey, you know what? Remember the other person who was on the cross next to me? He's now in paradise. That was my wish and prayer for you, but you always refused to believe. Jesus will never say this to us because of this. We never need to fear death. Think about that. When Jesus rose from the dead as his followers, Jesus has switched the hinges on the doorway that when we die, it'll not swing to eternal death, but now, through faith in Christ, it swings to eternal life. How do we know this? Well, look at what Jesus himself says in Revelation chapter 1. Great passage. Jesus says, fear not. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And here's the statement. I hold the keys of death and Hades of hell. That's why this second truth is so awesome. Why is this teaching on Jesus' descent into hell so vitally important? Because it reminds us the work of salvation is absolutely complete. Again, everything that Jesus did by living our life perfectly in our place, offering his life as our substitute on Calvary's cross, and then by rising from the dead, it reminds us that, you know what? Jesus didn't do 99% and then leave us to figure out the 1% on our own to be saved. He's done everything. So look at how Romans 8 puts this. There is now, right now, no condemnation, no hell for those in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus descended into hell, you and I never, ever will have to as his faithful followers. You know what this reminds me of? You guys, if you're a sports fan, every once in a while, there's a game that you just don't want to miss, right? Maybe it's a, a Vikings game or a gopher game or the Wolves, the Twins, whatever. But it's a pivotal game, and you're like, oh, I don't want to miss this thing. But you have a meeting, an activity, an event that you have to go to. So you decide to record it. And as you're at this event or activity, what's the one thing that you're thinking in the back of your mind? nobody better tell me the score of this game, right? Because you want to see it for yourself. You want to find out. But every so often, somebody blurts out the score, and you're like, ugh. But if you're like me, if you find out your team won the game, when you get home, what do you do? You watch it anyway, right? And then when the miscues and the fumbles and the interceptions and the drop balls and everything else that normally would cause people to yell at the TV, allegedly, right? <laughs> you know, when, instead of doing that, you're, not, you don't, you're like, well, that's no problem because you know the outcome. You know that your team is a winner. And by the way, that's the greatest thing about the descent into hell. The devil is now a toothless lion. So, 1 Peter tells us that Satan is a roaring lion seeking those who he can devour. But like I said, you never have to think twice about the devil or demons. You know, it's never God versus the devil. Who's going to win? The devil has been defanged. He's declawed. He's a defeated foe. So again, every day we know how the story ends. We know how the game ends, right? Jesus has already won. The powers of darkness have been defeated. And Jesus says to you and I, I'm not only with you, I'm not only for you every day, I'm in you. 
and I've given you my all-powerful word that's at your disposal every moment of every day. And because of that, you and I live with victory. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Jesus, thank you for making all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. Thank you for conquering the grave and descending to hell to announce you hold the keys over death and hell. We praise you for your limitless love, your power and grace, and we praise you for being the conqueror, the victor, the redeemer, and our friend. Holy Spirit, shine your light in us, through us, and over us. Empower us to make a difference in the world and for the glory of God and for his purposes. And Father, protect all professional church workers who are going to be traveling here to Family of Christ for a conference later this week. Send your Holy Spirit to assist them in learning and putting into practice the new things that your Spirit teaches. And Lord, comfort all of those who are grieving the recent death of loved ones. Pour out your resurrection peace, especially on Jeff and Gina Greengard and their family as they mourn the recent death of their grandmother, Irma. And Lord, thank you earlier at our 9 o'clock service that we had an opportunity to commission five new Stephen ministers. So Lord, thank you for the 15 Stephen ministers in our church who every week visit with people one-on-one in a confidential way to share your love, your compassion, your listening, and most of all, your healing. Continue to bless their ministry in the months to come. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us, for to you all alone we give all glory, honor, worship in the name of Jesus, who has taught us all to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So every month, I would guess that Pastor Craig and I visit, I don't know, anywhere from 20 to 25 shut-ins who are unable to drive to church. Maybe they don't have a car, maybe they're in a nursing home. And every single time that we meet with them, everybody, every one of these shut-ins is at a different place. So uh, some of them have lost a lot of their memory. And so I've been here for eight years, and some of the stories of some of our shut-ins I've heard many times. Many times, right? They've been repeating the same story month after month. But the, here's the coolest thing, and I really want you to think about this. When I visit them, you know, they may not remember a lot of things, but when we start to say the Lord's Prayer, guess what? They nail it. And then when we receive the Lord's Supper, in the back of my mind, I'm always a little bit jealous because I know, you know, again, I don't know how God's will is going to turn out, but I'm pretty confident a number of those people are going to be worshiping and rejoicing in God's heavenly presence before I get there, right? And I'm like, ooh, you're one step closer to the victory circle than most of us. Today, as you receive the Lord's Supper, let it be a reminder that God gives you his best, his body and blood of his Son, to forgive you, to strengthen you, to empower you. But as you receive this, it's kind of like receiving an hors d'oeuvre. One day, you're going to get the feast at the heavenly banquet in Jesus' presence. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So come forward today with anticipation, with joy, knowing that, again, one day you're going to get the big feast in our Lord's presence.
Sometimes I wonder if he's faithful Does he see me in my trouble? Does he understand? Sometimes I question if he's able Can he rescue? Can he save me again and again? When I look back Did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he did So yes, he can Did he defeat the darkness? Did he deliver me? Yes, he did So yes, he can Yes, he did So yes, he can Sometimes those voices try to tell me I'm forgotten and I'm falling so far from me saying But I know what kind of God he is And I'm trusting in his promises I'm believing and I'm singing Yes, he can Did he move every mountain? Did he part every sin? Every single time From the beginning Until the end He did He will He can Did he move every mountain Did he part every sea Yes he did So yes he Did he part every sea? this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and keep you all in faith until life everlasting. Depart in his peace knowing your sins have been fully forgiven. Amen. Well, we've got a few things to announce before we close with our blessing today. First of all, um, remember that uh, Pete Hiller is going to come up. Great. You got a mic handheld? Is there one up there? Yes. All right. As Pete gets ready, couple things to announce. Remember that this Saturday, 
We have uh, an opportunity to work at our near mission site at Trinity First Lutheran School in Minneapolis. It's their work day, so from 9 to 3, if you need a ride to that or uh, need more information about that, you can catch me after church or catch Pete Mumford. Along with that, our new member orientation. So if you want to become a member here at Family of Christ, that's going to take place in two Saturdays. So that will take place on, is that the 29th? Yes. So Pastor Craig will be teaching that from 9 to 1 with lunch included. So if you want to uh, seek to become a member, please uh, email either Pastor Craig or myself or the church office sometime in the next week. But far more importantly... I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, tell um, us about some great opportunities that we have in the yeah, youth ministry world. Yeah, definitely. So our youth, uh, you know, we've been highlighting a few things coming up with the youth. Particularly this summer, they're going to be going to Idaho. Uh, they're going to be doing a serving event up in the panhandle of Idaho. And uh, Family of Christ has been just so generous in supporting them and their mission trips and youth gatherings. And we'll give you another opportunity to do that. So out in the lobby today, uh, actually the plant sale has been going on for a few weeks. Today's the deadline to get your order in. So if you want to still order bedding plants and potted plants for, it seems like... Um, like people are thinking, did summer happen and end already? But um, I, I'm pretty sure that we'll have some nicer weather ahead here and you can plant things. But so if you want to support our youth that way, that'd be great. But if you don't have a green thumb, um, we also have an opportunity. We do a one to 100 fundraiser for our youth. And it's just a chance for you to donate directly to support our youth on this mission trip. They're going to be serving people and families and doing habitat renewal and things like that. So if you want to support them in that endeavor, there's a 1 to 100 table out there and you can make a financial donation directly to the youth in the amount of 1 to $100. Um, and you can grab an envelope, they're due back May 15th, and uh, just a way to directly support our youth. So, um, and I'll be out there if you have any questions. One other uh, topic, totally unrelated, is with our missions. So on, uh, on April 30th, two weeks from today, uh, Family of Christ is going to be doing what we call an igniter event, and it's an opportunity for the congregation to pour into uh, the decisions we make around the missions we support. So we have a here, near, and far uh, mission partnership that we do. Um, we are uh, due to select a new far mission. Uh, it's been Yisleta for the past seven years, eight years or so. And um, so it's, it is kind of the time for us to renew that, either if we're going to continue with Yisleta or if we're going to select a new mission partnership. So on the 30th, we're going to share information about that, plus sharing some information about some here partnerships that we could part, or, uh, engage with. We're looking at possibly adding a second here mission partnership. Um, the Trinity First mission uh, partnership that we have, is it's good for several more years, so we don't need to decide on that. So on the 30th, after each service, we're gonna have a quick information meeting about uh, our mission partnerships and a chance for the congregation to pour in on the decision we make on those. So we encourage you to come to that. Also, if you would like to nominate a FAR mission partnership or a HERE mission partnership, um, kind of email me and I'll get you the information that you need to make a nomination, so. All right, thanks Pete for all the options. do you wanna give me some love here, Jackie? Uh, <laughs> you guys are probably like, enough of him, all right? One last thing I wanted to announce. These signs, the He is Risen signs, were painted by all of our kids and their families who came to the Good Friday uh, family service in the morning. So I just think that was really cool that they put that together. So great idea by Ruth, and thanks for all the kids for putting that together for us. Well, let's head out with the, the blessing of our Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the presence, the peace of our risen Savior be and remain with us always. Amen. So again, now that you know the meaning of the descent into hell, with all of that victory, let's go in peace and serve the Lord. I question if he's able.